Okay. Thank you very much for coming here today. Our speaker today is uh, Professor Jerry Bona. He was born in 1945 in Little Rock, Arkansas, or so uh, Wikipedia says about you. That's you, you correct. Have, you did Bachelor of Science at My the said so. Washington University in St. Louis, yes. where also Katie and Vera did her Bachelor, PhD in Harvard. Then in the 1772, you spent some time at the Fluid Mechanics Research Institute at Essex. the University of Exeter, where you worked with Brooke Benjamin and Mahoney, and you developed an equation for long waves in nonlinear dispersive system, also known as the Benjamin Bonham Mahoney equation, that improved on the KDB equation. Then I returned to the US, where he then became a professor of mathematics and is now working at the University of Illinois. He supervised over 30 students, I counted on your CV and more than 20 postdocs. You have over 200 publications. You've been a visiting professor of multiple institutions, chair of many boards, organizer of many conferences. And I remember him from Cause Waves in 2018 in Auckland, where he was invited speaker. And now we have him here as invited speaker, talking about the mathematics and the ocean. Floris is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here. The last time I was here was an order of 50 years ago. <laughs> the main building hasn't changed, but there are some new ones. Um, it's a it really is a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for organizing so well. Uh, I'm going to talk about... Okay, this, so this lecture is aimed more at graduate students. So the senior folks are allowed to sleep. Hopefully, Short with you. Um, I'm, before I start, I need to acknowledge that there's a lot of people's work who's going to appear, and I'm not going to single out who did what or when. These people include um, mathematicians, but they also include um, people in fluid mechanics, oceanographers, coastal engineers, uh, even some biologists are in there. And we'll see if I get to all of that. OK, so what I want to do first is I'm going to show you some, some, it's about the ocean. I'm going to show you some oceanic things. Uh, these would be real, real pictures of real things. And these are going to throw up some questions. And then I'm going to try to answer those questions with uh, some water wave models. So that's the, that's the scheme, and then we'll go see how well they work. Okay, so I'm going to start with tsunamis. Um, you all know what a tsunami is. Uh, Thucydides actually figured out a long time ago um, what caused the particular tsunami he's talking about here. And by the way, I'm told by my Greek collaborators, this is a dreadful translation. His, his real writing is much more graceful. Okay, so this is this is a tsunami coming on board. This is a relatively small one. This is off the coast of Hawaii. And it's the same tsunami, and you might wonder why the guy who's taking the picture is not running. That's gonna we'll come back to that. This is this recent one uh, in Japan, uh, off the coast of Japan near Sendai. Um, so there's the tsunami. You can't tell how big that is because you don't have a vertical scale. No way to say if that's a yard or six meters or whatever. You still can't tell the scale because you don't have anything vertical. But now you do. You can see the scale of the tsunami. Um, Okay, this is this is the epicenter, which is, as I say, off the coast of Japan near Sendai. My friends in Sendai <laughs> reported that their math books were scattered everywhere. Okay, this this is Sri Lanka. This is the south coast of Sri Lanka, and um, you're up in a plane, so you're not in any trouble. <coughs> they missed the first wave. It happened before they knew what was happening. And you see that the first wave has already come across. But now they're paying attention. 
And um, okay, so the second wave is about to come. If, if something to be learned here, if you're at a beach and the water begins to run out, like somebody pulled the plug, you go the other way because what's coming is the second wave here. Okay, so this is the same tsunami, uh, but this is Thailand. And um, you see it coming on board. You see the American tourists not doing anything. <laughs> the rest of the people are going the right direction. This is also Thailand. It's a different beach. Uh, this is an interesting set of um, photographs. So you see that, and, and we'll get to in a little, little bit, the tsunami is out in the middle of the ocean, almost undetectable. You could be in a relatively small boat, you might not notice it go by. Amplitude is very, very small, and the wavelength is enormous. But when, the, when that wave gets, begins to feel the bottom in a serious way, which is what's happening here, the wavelength shortens and the mass goes into amplitude. So you, this is, this is a, the first wave has gone out, and people here are picking up shells from a beach that's empty. Normally, there, there would have been water there. And here you see this, this, this wave forming and coming on board. All right, you, you can't tell how big it is. Again, you don't have a vertical scale. You still don't have a vertical scale. Well, it does look kind of dangerous. But now you have a vertical scale. That's the first. So that was. OK, so the question is, where did we get these pictures? The camera was destroyed, but the chip was still intact. And that's where the pictures come from. OK, now, <clears throat> this is that uh, um, tsunami that I showed you, I've just been showing you, the one that hit Sri Lanka and, and um, <coughs> Thailand. Um, so the epicenter is right here by uh, Indonesia. So, oh, and the countries that are colored in yellow are the ones that had serious damage. And the definition of serious damage is somebody died. Okay, so people died in South Africa from that tsunami. So first question that comes to mind is how in the world Whatever you might have done here, how does that get across thousands of kilometers of ocean and still have enough punch to hurt somebody? That's the first question. And then the second question is, uh, comes up when you look at these deaths. So, of course, Indonesia got the worst of it. But I want to point out Sri Lanka and Thailand. There's a factor of four difference in the death total. These are approximate numbers, just estimates. And the question is why? Because they're about the same different distance from the epicenter, and they have about the same exposure in terms of coastline. So what, what's in this factor of four? That's the second question I'd like to know the answer to. Now, different topic. This is rogue waves. So rogue waves are nothing like a tsunami. A tsunami, as I said, in the deep ocean, you can hardly detect it from the surface. You can detect it from satellites, but not from the surface. So a rogue wave, i show you one. So that's the North Sea. And if you look in the background, you'll see that this is not a rough North Sea. This is not a stormy day or anything like that. But you do see this wave forming right here at the back of the boat. And here it comes. OK, so there was no place to run. So the guy just kept taking pictures, right? Um, so a rogue wave is, let's see, I think. Yeah, this is a, a boat going into the trough of a rogue wave. Not good for boats. Uh, boats are built to, to take enormous stresses this way, but they're not very good about this kind of stuff. They, they can break. 
That's a shallow water rogue wave. This is not deep water, this is shallow water. Sorry. Why is this not working? Sorry. Um, okay, so here's the here's our field observation. We're not doing the field observations. So this is um, a, a Norwegian oil platform. It's New Year's Day. I don't know why they had instruments in the water, but they did. And so you see a fairly rough scene. And then you see this thing. It's about, about <clears throat> crest to trough, that's about 30 meters. That's a huge wave. Um, it's just one. And then it goes back to where it was. Um, probably the wave is bigger than 30 meters because the instruments saturate. I, I doubt if they could measure anything larger than that. So this is this is what happens with a rogue wave. You have a a set of waves, and then all of a sudden you have one or sometimes two much larger waves. It's it's a wave that's localized in both space and time. So it, it, it's not like a tsunami. Tsunamis propagate, as you just saw, uh, thousands of kilometers. Rogue waves appear and they disappear. Okay, so where do they come from? Oh, well, that's what a rogue wave can do to a boat, by the way. And that was an aircraft carrier, and one wave did that. So these things, these things are powerful. That was an oil platform that didn't do too well. Okay, now there are ideas about why these, how these things form. So one of them is concurrence. So what does concurrence mean? It means that you look out at the ocean and you see lots of energy it's everywhere, and maybe things are just right. They get together and have a party for a little while, and that's where you get your big wave, and then they disappear. That's concurrence. Uh, you could be an oceanographer too. Okay, there's a statistical theory of wave amplitude. That roughly says something like, um, if I look at probability of wave amplitudes, some kind of distribution like that, and out here are the rogue waves. But of course, that doesn't tell you why this is the distribution. So it's not very satisfactory. Wave current and direction, that's more interesting. This is a situation where you have a current running not very deep, and you have a fetch of wind coming the other way. That can generate pretty big waves. You can see that on rivers, actually. Topographical forcing, of course, that wouldn't work in deep water, but it might work in shallow water. So the, the Norwegians actually tried for years to use topographical forcing to get energy out of waves. They tried to channel waves, get large waves, take the energy out. It, it didn't work. Okay, by the way, there's another place where rogue waves appear. That's the fiber optics cable. It's more recent. That's another version of fiber optics cables. They're actually rather complicated things, but the idea is very simple. It's, it's kind of glass. You put light in at one end. The, it's made so that the light will not escape out the sides, and it comes out the other end. So if I had fiber optic cable, a big roll of it, and we made it dark in here, and I put a light through, through one end of it, if you could see the cable, it's bad. Light's not supposed to come out until you get to the end. Okay, that's what if I, so you, fiber optic cable, of course, are used for communication. Now, here's an experiment, which I won't explain in detail, but there's a roadway. And again, the instrument couldn't possibly measure anything much bigger than that, so it saturates. Uh, but it appears there are roadways in fiber optic cables as well. Okay, so the question I want to know the answer to is, let's go back to my first question, well, the question I'll answer today, concurrence. Is it possible in, in, the, in say, from the 
Euler equations and the non Lee Stokes equations to have small waves all over the place somehow coming together and making a big wave or not. It's not obvious because maybe the small waves are linear and so you can organize them to come together the same part of space time. But then nonlinear effects are going to step in and probably that's going to kill that off. So that's the first, that's the question I want to know the answer to. Oh, sandbars. Okay, you all know what a sandbar is. You know, you're at the beach, you walk out, it's getting <coughs> deeper, and then it gets shallow again, you're walking over a sandbar. So let me show you a few sandbars. Uh, this is off the coast of, well, it is Madeline Island, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Here you can see there are three bars that you can see just by looking. And there are, in fact, just three bars. That's the same. It's, I'm about 10 miles down the coast now, and that's the same set of bars. They just run more or less linearly for miles. Uh, this is this is Australia. Um, again, you see what looks like three bars. In fact, there are five, but you can't see the other two because they're a little deep to see this way. So I'm going to run down the coast. Those bars, they just they just run linearly down the coast. OK, now th this is Madeline Island. This is the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And here's the island itself. It has a wonderful set of sandbars. It's not the only attraction, actually. There are commercial flights there, but um, there are a lot of birds. All right, now let me show you. This is what we're, we're trying to understand. This is actual bottom bathymetry. This is a measurement of what the bottom looked like, a strip of it going out from the from the coast. And these are the sandbars. And I'm going to be interested in how do they get there? And they turn out to be important for a reason we'll get to. OK, blood flow, I probably won't get to, to this part, but let me just show you. Uh, here's the artery system. And what I'm actually, OK, so you're all familiar with uh, oh, that's the mathematician's version of, of blood flow of the artery system. Um, you're all familiar with this business where calcification sets in, the arteries get squeezed down, and you begin to have trouble. But you may not know, so that's, that's the peripheral art artery system. There's another part of the system. It's the part that runs blood through, through the lungs. So this side of the heart, pumps blood through the lungs, and then it goes back into the heart, the other, the other side sends it everywhere. You can have trouble here, too. Um, it's not from calcification. Actually, we don't quite understand what it's from. Um, you get a, a thickening, but it's, it's, not, it's not deposits from outside. It's the artery itself uh, having trouble. So this, was a disease unknown to me about five years ago, but uh, it, it's evidently a quite a serious disease. And what it does to you is but the human body is wonderful. It figures out that it's not getting enough blood through the lungs, so the heart pumps harder. Okay, how does the heart pump harder? Well, it enlarges. So you, you're seeing time lapses here of, of the heart. Eventually, it, it gets it enlarges sufficiently that the walls become too thin, and it's the heart that fails, not the lungs. But the problem was here. And okay, we, we as I say, we're working on this. This is something we're working on. One part of it, okay, so there's a laboratory scientist involved in the field, but one part of it needs a blood flow model. That's a piece of what's going on, and that's where. We come in. The equations are more or less the same as some of the equations I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Okay, by the way, this disease um, generated something interesting. So they were trying a drug out that um, they hoped would help, and it didn't help. But it turned out it had other features. It was Viagra. So Viagra came, didn't come from what you think. It came from trying to solve this problem. Okay, now let's talk about deriving a water wave model. 
I'm going to do this very quickly. So I'm going to take a flat ocean, <clears throat> flat bottom, and uh, I've got parameters. So A is a typical amplitude, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not concerned with how the disturbance got there at this point. I will be later, but not now. I suppose there's a disturbance on the ocean. <coughs> I've got an amplitude A, and H naught is the undisturbed depth. And as I say, it's flat. Uh, so this is a number, it's just a number. And in a minute, I'm going to assume it's small. So that means small amplitude. Now, small, as it turns out, doesn't mean microscopic. Amplitudes of 0.2 or 0.3, that is alphas of 0.2 and 0.3, are just fine. So not so small. Then beta is the undisturbed depth over a typical wavelength. Okay, and that's also non-dimensional, and that will also be small. And then there's a combination S, which is alpha upon beta squared, A lambda squared of H naught cubed. I call it the Stokes number because Stokes wrote it down in the 1840s. Okay, in Britain they call it the Urschel number because um, Bridge wrote it down in the 1950s. I think Stokes gets, has, has the, has the call on that one. Okay, so this, these are the scaled Euler equations. The water, uh, this is a water wave model. There's no dissipation here. It's not not these dose. So, y is the velocity potential. So that means that the gradient of phi is the velocity field. Okay, and, okay, we're assuming it's irrotational and incompressible. So we have a, um, a potential. Uh, and that top equation is just the Laplace's equation, except notice the scaling. Yeah, I've already done that. The horizontal coordinates are scaled by lambda, the wavelength. So now the wavelength is order one. And the vertical coordinate is scaled by the depth, so the undisturbed depth. So that now the undisturbed depth is one. Okay. Then. Eta, eta, which is, okay, let's tell you what eta is. Eta is the deviation of the free surface from its rest position. So if this is the bottom, here's the undisturbed free surface, here's the free surface itself, and eta. Okay, so if h is the depth above the point x, y time t, so that could be this, then eta is the deviation. So h, of course, is not small, but eta could be small. All right, so if you like, this is 1 plus alpha times eta. in my scale variables. Okay, so the top equation just says that the velocity potential satisfies Laplace's equation, except there's a beta in there because of the scaling x, y is different from z. Um, on the bottom, sorry, that should be z equals zero. That's a typo. Um, on the bottom, d phi dz is zero. d phi dz is the vertical velocity, right? Remember, the gradient of phi is the velocity field. So this is just saying that there's no flow through the bottom and nothing come out of the bottom either. So all that's linear and very simple. All this, the whole problem is these two, these two partial differential equations, time dependent. They are boundary conditions. They're not, they're, they don't hold in the flow domain, they hold on the boundary. On the boundary, the top boundary. And um, let's see, the second one is just a kinematic condition. Roughly speaking, it says nothing more than um, if you want to know where the free surface is going, a point on the free surface is going a little bit later, there's two ways to get it. One is to just take the velocity and, and multiply by delta t, and the other is to take the deviation and then project over there. 
And that's all this says. It's just a kinematic condition that says that stuff on the free surface stays there. The water wave problem is that first equation. That's Bernoulli's equation. And okay, I won't try to explain that either you know it or you don't. Otherwise, I'd take a lot of time. So this, these are the Euler equations. And they're pretty complicated. And there's still lots of things we don't know about them. Many, many things. It's a current research, uh, some current research cir circles around this set of equations. OK. Now, I'm showing you a picture of these waves. This is, again, off the coast of Australia. I'm going to call these, these waves long-crested waves. So let's call that x and that y. In the x direction, things are changing. In the y direction, not so much. So often what we do is we assume that the wave has no variation in the y direction. So that means that the velocity in the y direction is zero. And um, anytime you see a d by dy, you get to toss it out. That's a close up of those waves. So the two dimensional Euler equations appear. So it's the same set of equations I just showed you, except that um, lots of things drop out. Okay, and now I have to make a, a, a presumption about this number s. So out, remember, alpha is going to be smallish, beta squared is going to be smallish, and I'm going to assume s is order one. So that means alpha is order beta squared, and I'm, I'm just for convenience, I'm going to take s equals to one, and I, I now have two small parameters, alpha, which is a over h naught, and beta squared, which is h naught squared over lambda squared, I'm going to just call them epsilon, because if we all know epsilon is small. Okay, so here's, here are the equations after, after getting rid of the y variables, and, um, and uh, substituting beta squared and alpha <coughs> by epsilon. So this is the set of equations that we've got. So I say it's pretty complicated. Uh, even numerically, this is quite a complicated system of equations. So for many of the applications of water wave theory, um, including the ones that I've been talking about, this is too complicated. And moreover, it's too accurate. That is, the data you're going to put into it has nothing like this accuracy. So you would like a simpler one. And that fell to Boussinesque. In the 1870s, uh, he was working on uh, water wave theory. And um, all right, so let me do the same slide. How do you simplify it? <coughs> Well, here's an idea. We've got a velocity potential, which is a function of, remember, y variables gone, x, z, the vertical coordinate, and t. And let's just expand it in a Taylor series in the z variable. So I'm expanding, expanding around z equals 0, upward. OK, why not? If you take that form and you Plug it into, so let's look at the linear stuff first. Um, the first two equations. All right. What you will find is a recursion relation. You'll find that phi 2 is determined by phi 0, phi 4 by phi 2, phi 1 by phi 3, phi 3 by phi, phi 1, and so forth. Okay. And then first thing to notice that will make your life a little easier is that Remember the condition on the bottom. d phi dz at z equals zero is zero. But d phi dz at z equals zero is just phi one. So phi one is zero. And that means that phi three, phi five, phi five, all the odd ones are zero. So you've gotten rid of half of your problem. And then using that little recursion relation, you end up with this one. Okay, so this is formal. 
It's formal, but it's exact. Didn't make any approximation. Didn't didn't assume epsilon was small or anything like that. It's formal. In formal power series, this is a solution of Laplace's equation with the boundary condition at the bottom. Okay. Now your job is to stick that into these two boundary conditions at the top. And now you have to make approximations because your sheet of paper is not big enough. Um, so you have to decide. Now, now epsilon being small comes into play. You have to decide how small, which, which epsilon you're going to keep. You keep epsilon, you keep epsilon squared, you keep any order you want. And people have kept various orders. But what turns out if you just keep order epsilon and drop anything with an epsilon squared or above in it, you get this pair of equations. Okay, this is in terms of a horizontal velocity um, at the bottom. That's just what comes out without any fussing around. So u is the horizontal velocity at the bottom. Remember, I'm in a two-dimensional situation. And eta is that deviation of the free surface. You get this couple pair of equations, which is a Boussinesque equation, Boussinesque system. This is a very poor model. Why is it a poor model? Because the horizontal velocity at the bottom is zero. The real one. Because there's that viscous boundary layer that brings the velocity to zero at the bottom. So <coughs> this is useless. An engineer can't measure a horizontal velocity at the bottom because there is no. They, they typically, they put a typical kind of thing they do is they put a velocity meter somewhere in the middle, at some, some particular height, um, theta times h, h naught, say. OK. It turns out that you can, OK, so the, this, this level of the modeling I teach to undergraduates. It's not complicated. You just have to take them through it. The next level of the modeling, modeling is a little more complicated, so I'm going to abbreviate it. Um, so here's a here's a sort of a cartoon of what one can do. You can in fact do what I've just done for the three-dimensional problem as well. Okay, the assumptions are alpha and beta small and s order one. If your first step is a three-dimensional boost and s system. If you assume that the waves are moving in one direction, which is often the case, then you get Kadamsev Petkesh Philly like equations. At the two dimensional level, you get two dimensional Boussinesque, you get perfect degrees from PPM, and at the very bottom level, uh, you get Lagrange, the wave equation. Okay, so this is a sort of a scheme, if you like. And what I want to show you, I want to focus over here. Okay, so as I say, there are now tricks to be played uh, which require a bit of knowledge. Uh, you end up with a couple pair of equations. Again, it's for a velocity u and a deviation eta. But the velocity u is no longer the velocity at the bottom. It's a velocity at a certain height. And you can specify the height. And the height is specified by theta, which is between 0 and 1. It can be any number between 0 and 1. And you get, okay, so you get this four parameter, looks like four parameters is not three parameter, family of equations that formally are all the same. That is, they're all good to order epsilon squared. Formal. Okay. Okay, you can do it for three dimensions too. We don't care about that. Here's some specializations. So these are. Choices of theta, lambda, and mu. Theta is a, is a physical quantity. It tells you which height you're, you're taking your velocity at. Lambda and mu are just modeling parameters. Any real number could be used. Okay, so here's a here's some some specializations. There's a couple of quarter degrees type system. There's a Regularized Boussinesque system. 
Um, there's a system that Ron Smith and I derived a long time ago. This is Busnesk's original system. Actually, it's not. If you look in Busnesk, this is not what he wrote down. It's almost what he wrote down, not quite. Okay, now how shall we how, how shall we decide which one to tell an engineer of some sort to use? So we have criteria. It should be well posed. That is, that specify initial data. Uh, I should get a solution at least locally in time. And I would prefer globally, so I don't have to worry about singularity formation. I'd like it to preserve energy because the Euler equation preserves energy. Um, I'd like it to have solitary waves because we know those are important. And well, you might write a little theorem in your back pocket that says that the solutions of this Boussinet system is in fact close to the solution of the Euler equations. You'd like a theorem like that. And then of course you could always go out in the lab and see if it works. Okay. Okay, I'm, I think I'm going to Skip. I'm, what, I'm, what I'm showing here is the emergence of solitary waves from an initial hump. So time is time is going this way. This is the initial value. Uh, I put in just a heap of water, no velocity, zero velocity, and uh, I watch the solution evolve. And sure enough, it resolves itself into solitary waves. And that seems to be true of all of these these equations. Okay, comparisons between the models. Okay, so remember this is the, this is the situation we're in. Right now I'm looking at that first step, two-dimensional weather to two-dimensional Brusnesk. <coughs> Over so you're you're sure that even if these models, these little small models, approximate Euler, it will not be for all time. It's not going to be. So the question is, over what time scale? So let me do a, a, a toy experiment to give you an idea. Suppose that this is my full my, my, my model equation, and this one is my full equations, where epsilon is supposed to represent all that stuff that I left out. The question is, how long does <coughs> this one approximate that one? I'll start off with the same initial data. You can write the solutions of the equations down. This one is phi of x minus t. This one is phi of x minus t plus epsilon t. You can take the difference. The difference is epsilon t. So on a time scale of order one in these variables, it's a good approximation. U is a good approximation of t. On a time scale of one over order one over epsilon, u no longer approximates. Okay, so of course that's sort of trivial, but we would imagine that the longer time scale, which I'm going to call this nest time scale, isn't approximated by the linear wave equation anymore, but okay, let me okay, this is a formal analogy. We might expect that the Boussinesque system approximates on this time scale, because I included terms of order epsilon, and it will not be good on that time scale. Okay, that's what we would expect. Okay, what's amazing is that there's a theorem that says exactly that. Okay, it's a, it's a group of papers, not just one paper. Um, okay, I forgot to put the slide in where I gave a list of the people who contributed. But in any case, at this point, we actually have theory that says that these Boussinesque equations approximate order on this time scale and not on this time scale. Okay, so okay, what we did was formal, and then it's a hard slog to make it. Okay, so you can remember I had the Boussinesque system and then I had the one-way models. The Boussinesque system is a couple pair of equations, so you need two initial data, one for u and one for eta. The one-way models have only one initial condition. So how do you get from a two-way model to a one-way model? Well, you have to have special 
situation, special relationship between the initial conditions for the system. And if that special relationship holds, um, one-way models, and here are comparisons between two-way and one-way models, when we put in the right initial data to the two-way model, we see it's really rather close. This is with epsilon 0.2. Even with epsilon 0.5, the difference is not much. Okay. Let's, I'm going to run through some experiments quickly to convince you these things have predictive power. So here's a here's a wave channel. This is Penn State. Um, there's a wave maker down at that end, and this experiment's very simple. Everything's at rest. You turn on the wave maker and you oscillate it. And you have control of two things. You have control of the amplitude of the oscillation and the frequency. And the frequency is good to 10 to the minus 6, by the way. Um, that translates into control of what I call A, the amplitude of the wave, and what I call lambda, the uh, wavelength. The frequency and the wavelength are related, and the amplitude of the wave maker and the wave it produces are related. Okay. So here's the experiment. Let's say we everything's at rest, we turn on the wave maker, and we have measured devices scattered down the channel. This is not an initial value problem. Uh, you, 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 determining a wave profile everywhere in a channel at a fixed time is not very accurate. Take a picture, but it's not very accurate. This is much more accurate. I'm measuring, I'm measuring, actually what I'm measuring is the capacitance between that plate and the water surface. And the, the response time of that is plenty good enough for measuring these kind of waves. So we take four measurements, and then we use the first measurement as boundary data. Not initial data, it's boundary data. All right, so the mathematical setup is an initial value value problem where the initial data is zero because it's at rest. And this is x, this is t, which is undisturbed. Here's, let's call it x naught, here's x1. These are the measuring devices. And their readouts are functions of time, a function of x, a function of t. Okay, so I use the first one, this one. Let's call that g of t temporarily as boundary data. Okay, so now I have to be sure that uh, that boundary value problem makes good sense. Okay, the initial data, remember, is zero. You don't have to measure it. Okay, let's see how it works. All right, so that's a typical boundary data. And I stuck it up this way so you remember it's time, not space, that you're seeing. So this is very typical. This, this first device is about 25, 30 centimeters down from the wave maker. You can't take stuff directly off the wave maker. There's a parasitic field that lives on the face of that wave maker, gets in the way. And also it's a moving situation. So that makes life complicated. Okay, so that's boundary data. And now let's see, I'm putting that into a code for the initial boundary value problem. Zero initial data is that as boundary data. And I'm going to integrate it. And here's what you get. So remember, I, I didn't put them up this time, but these are temporal traces, not spatial traces. Okay, so this is Stokes number four which is right where the model should work, and indeed it seems to work pretty well. Okay. Those waves look very simple. They're not as simple as you think. Uh, this is what the computer thinks is in the wave channel as a function of different times. Okay, so it's, these are spatial traces. It's the temporal traces of those that gave that comparison. All right, now that's Stokes number four is actually not something the 
people I work with much care about. They care about much larger Stokes numbers. <coughs> so here's Stokes number 25. And it's the, the boundary data looks the same. You can't tell the difference. But now you see there's a secondary crest that's emerged uh, in the propagation down the channel. That secondary crest is under the primary crest here. You begin to see it coming out. And you see the model and the reality diverging. And you can fix that, actually. But um, my engineering friends thought this was perfect. Easy to please. Um, <coughs> this is what's in the channel, according to the computer. Well, you see, that's a rather complicated waveform that's generating a pretty good agreement. Okay. Well, there, are, uh, there are other reasons why you think these, these models are good, but I'm going to skip that. Let's go back. How am I doing? Go back to tsunamis. All right, so that tsunami that attacked Sri Lanka and Thailand was formed this way. These big plates that make up the surface of the ocean, they sometimes butt into each other, and it was the tension got sufficient that the one on the left slid under the one on the right. That had the effect of raising the bottom. Uh, 18 inches, something of that sort, not very much. Of course, water's not compressible, it's not like this. So you get an 18 inch bulge on the surface right away. So bulge on the surface, it doesn't stay there, right? Gravity's at work. So a wave starts to propagate. And this, the scale is like that, it's a small wave, but it has very large extent. The wavelength is big. So it's not to be across deep water in some form, and then it runs up on the coast. Okay, these are more or less the shallow water equation. We know what happens here. Um, well, we know what happens here until it starts to break, then it gets complicated. We don't know so much. All right, so what I'm concerned with is this part, propagation in deep water. And the question is, how does that signal hold together? And the answer is something I didn't mention before, but I should have. If you look at these baby one-way one -way models, okay, I'm, I'm leaving out constants. Say the Corbett degrees equation. There are two. Uh, this is just. Translation. There are two effects here. There's, this is nonlinear effects. This is what's called dispersive effects. The nonlinear effects we understand pretty well. Uh, that just steeply. If I ignored this term, the wave start out like that, and it would get steeper and steeper until it formed a shock. Okay. Um, the dispersive term spreads thing it out. That's what it does. You can. Study that by taking its Fourier transform. And what's interesting is that these two things can balance. And it's that balance that holds the wave together. Okay, so let's. Okay. Model I'm using, one of those ABCD models. Okay, so here I'm starting with initial data, which is a heap of water, as I advertised. Okay. And um, it's an exponential, but doesn't matter much. And it starts with zero velocity, zero horizontal velocity, which is okay. That's about what happens uh, in the real world there. Okay, so let's watch it develop. It doesn't just come apart, and that's the competition of nonlinearity and dispersion that's keeping it together. So, sure <coughs> enough, I've propagated it across an ocean by now. And um, I've got a wave coming up on my beaches. But I don't see any difference between the Thai beach and the Sri Lankan beach. You know, there's this way is Thailand, that way is Sri Lanka, they look the same. So that doesn't explain that factor of four that we saw before. And the reason is that I didn't take a very good initial data. Um, that heap of water was circular. The real initial data is an ellipse, 
let's call them the ribs, with very different to the axes. Okay, so let's put that in and see what we get. Okay, so you see the two semi axes are very different 0 0.04 and 16. Okay, so now let's, pro I didn't show you the initial heat there. Let's propagate this out. Okay, you get a lot of secondary crests, which some of which would be caught by damping. Okay, and now we do see a difference in this direction and that direction. It's almost a factor of four difference in the amplitude, three, three point something. Okay, so there's a lesson there. If you're going to buy a beachfront property and you know there's a fault line out there, you want to buy it here, but not there. Right, let me quickly go run through sandbars. Uh, how am I doing? Not very well. So you want me to stop you? In the next couple of minutes, yes. Okay. Okay, I won't go into the modeling of the sandbars, which is good fun. Oh, but I'll show you their use. This is Duck, North Carolina. Um, Duck is a, on that highway that starts down at, at uh, Nags Head. And uh, the U.S. Car Army Corps of Engineers was taking measurements here for 20 years, millions of dollars spent. Okay, they, once a month, weather permitting, they measured the bottom. So here's a situation where there's one bar, and that occurred frequently in the various times in the 20 years, 19 years. And now here's one with two bars. And that also occurred frequently. So how does it get from one to two or the other way around? And um, we, okay, we got the data, 89, January, February, and March. Um, okay, so in January and February, we had one bar. And in March, we had two bars. So what, what happened? The answer is a storm came through. So it's the, the square of the amplitude is what's important here. And it, quite a large storm near to hurricane level came through. So we did an, uh, there's the determination of the period of the wave. We did an experiment. We started off, time is running this way. And this is that initial one bar configuration. And then in our little model, which I haven't explained to you, we turned on the storm. So what that means is we turned up the amplitude and the wavelength got bigger. And, and you see that that evolves steadily to a two bar configuration. This is after two days. And that's more or less exactly what, what one sees. Okay, so I, I won't go through the rest of this, but I do want to show you the very end. How do we use this? Well, this is a beach, uh, Gold Coast of Australia, and uh, it's gone away. I'm told it was originally a beautiful big beach, not any longer. So a coastal engineer or somebody I worked with um, nourished it. Nourishing it just means you put sand there. And then very quickly, it went away. So you'd have to nourish every year. That didn't sound attractive. So we got the data, and the data showed there should be a big sandbar here about 150 meters offshore. There were just rocks. So we, we advised them to put sand there and let it form a sandbar, and then you'd be protected. And that's exactly what happened. And by the way, 10 years later, the beach is still there. Okay, sorry to go over. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jerry. We were uh, rush a little bit towards the end. We are gathering again in S120 for some biscuits and coffee.